Hello, my name is Richard Schaffer and I'm a radiation oncologist and medical director of Extral. On behalf of Extral and our CEO, Adrian Treverton, I'd like to welcome you to today's event on radiotherapy for hyperproliferative dis disorders. When I first started treating patients with radiotherapy for benign conditions, I found it hard to find reliable, clear and peer-reviewed evidence and practical information about how to deliver these treatments. Working closely with the session chairs, we've designed this educational event to start to close that gap. We did hope there would be a lot of interest in this topic, but we've been overwhelmed by the amazing response with more than 700 people registered for today's session. We'll be hosting another educational event tomorrow on the topic of radiotherapy for benign skin disorders. Separate registrations are required, so if you'd like to attend, please visit our website to learn more. Registration is still open. Although we have a very comprehensive program today, there were, very, there were many aspects we couldn't cover this year, and we'd really like your help with thinking about what this could look like moving forwards. At the end of today's session, we'll be emailing you a short, very short survey. We'd appreciate it if you could complete it so that we can understand what we've done well and what we could improve on. Also, please let us know what else you think we should include next time and how often you think we should hold these events. I'd also like to take this opportunity to announce the formation of a new organization, the International Society for Radiotherapy for Benign Conditions. You can find us at isrbc.org. We'd like to understand your views on how you think the society could help you with your clinical practice, so we've included a question in the survey about this. At the end of the survey, you'll receive a certificate of attendance. If you need a certificate, a certificate of attendance, please make sure you complete the survey because the process is automated and it's the only way to receive a certificate. We're also continuing to work with DEGRO on certification and we'll contact you with next steps when we know more. Now some housekeeping. This session has a full lineup of speakers. At the end of each talk, there will be a live Q&A with the panelists, moderated by my colleague, Christian Moby from Extra. You can use the question section of the GoToWebinar platform to submit your questions during the presentation, and the speakers will answer them at the end of each section. And with no further ado, I'll hand you over to today's session chair, Professor Heinrich Siegenschmidt. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody in the world, here on the panel, and uh, the organizers of Extra which helped us to set up this wonderful event of an international webinar on hyperproliferative disorders. Uh, as an introductory note, I will forward some information about common and different features of benign fibromatosis. This is sent to you from our radiotherapy institution at Osnabrück, Germany. Fibromatosis is considered a fibrous overgrowth of dermal and subcutaneous connective tissue, which develops to benign tumors, which are called fibromas. They are usually of benign, that means non-cancerous nature. They are characterized only by local growth. Eventually, they can penetrate or push away neighboring structures but they are not having any metastatic spread. They can be differentiated into superficial and deep, so-called desmoid types. The leading cell type in fibromatosis is a proliferating myofibroblast and fibroblast. They have special genetic dispositions in various disease types, predisposing factors and unknown trigger mechanism which are involved in the pathogenesis. You will hear in this webinar biological background as well as clinical situations in which radiotherapy is a worth, worthwhile tool to treat those fibromatosis. First of all, going to the major distributions. Again, we have three different types of fibromatosis, a superficial, so-called fascial type, and a more aggressive, deep located muscular aponeurotic type. In contrast, the malignant fibromatosis 
would result in a connective tissue malignant growth called fibrosarcoma, which is not dealt in this session. The local defined uh, fibromatosis can occur in skin, subcutaneous in tissues, and tendon sheets, while the aggressive type can occur in deeper structures involving muscles, tendons, and visual structures, including organs. The specific diseases which can occur from the superficial facial type are pathologic formation of scars, so-called keloids, palmar, plantar, and penile fibromatosis, other symptoms like frozen shoulders, and other hyperproliferative disorders like heterotopic ossification or um, graves orbitopathy, which are not there in this symposium. The aggressive type, deep muscular aponeurotic type fibromatosis, uh, is not dealt in this symposium, but it should be known that it requires much higher doses and is close to a benign but still a malignant condition due to growth and compression of vital structures. The different options to treat benign conditions, hypertrophic scars, keloids, palma, plantar and penile fibromatosis can be majorly surgery, but in certain situations also radiotherapy and specific drugs. These pathologic conditions can occur at various time points and in various locations. As you can see here, the right foot is uninvolved while the left foot has already little host disease, which is currently treated. In addition, the patient has a two-year follow-up on radiotherapy in the right hand and early signs of dipitra in the left hand. There's no rule to which organ starts first or which structure will progress more rapidly than the other. These are the different features we address in this symposium. We will address Dupuytren disease, Garrett's disease in the pip joints of the hands on the back side. We will address Lederhose disease, keloids in two examples here on the left ear and on the central chest wall and Peyronie's disease on the penile uh, shaft. All these diseases are characterized that radiotherapy indication is justified by symptom and pain relief, preservation of functional and of improvement chances with giving radiotherapy and surgery or uh, the treatments together. In keloids, cosmesis and aesthetic aspects may play an important role and also self-esteem and quality of life. Radiotherapy for hypertrophic scars and keloids is always a part of combined treatment approach, mostly in a defined post-operative setting usually after a first, second, or a repeatedly recurrent lesions. Radiotherapy in this instance has to be applied as soon as possible within 24 hours post-surgery. Here you can see the two examples on the helix of the ear and a very awkward long-term keloid pre-treated with various surgical and chemical structures and in this situation being treated as a primary uh, site without um, previously applied surgery. Radiotherapy for Peyronie's disease is not supported currently by international guidelines. However, principally useful at early stage, and at this stage there is no functional deficiency and the pathologic process is driven by proliferating fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. However, there are numerous numbers of studies where it has been historically used in more advanced stages for pain relief, 
improvement or stabilization of penile deviation and functional status. Here you see some basic setups of the radiation therapy technique, like the lead cover to protect the gonades and the electron beam cone to address the shaft of the penis. In Dipitra and Lederhose and Garrett's disease, which resembles the knucklepads, the primary prophylactic radiotherapy is the major indication. It is usually used in the early stage where only nodules and cords are present. In some situations, radiotherapy may be used as a post-interventional device after needle fasciectomy, collagenase injection, or limited open fasciectomy. It is also considered to be optional as a salvage radiotherapy after relapses, either after surgery or radiotherapy. However, most important, uh, the majority of cases will never require radiotherapy and has to be followed by defined wait and see strategies. Regarding the clinical concepts used for the four different indications we address in this symposium, there are three major concepts. First of all, the prophylactic early stage radiotherapy, where Dupiter and Lederhose patients have not been operated, but the early intervention allows to prevent surgery at all or delay the whole treatment process for years or decades. In this instance, two series of each five times three gray with a three months gap are applied. Usually, it is indicated to provide radiotherapy if a three to six months proven progress has been shown. In Peyronie's disease, prophylactic radiotherapy is rare. It's only indicated for early cases. Usually, only one RT series is given five times to seven times three gray. Again, the indication should only be given if a proven progress of a certain period of time has been addressed. Keloids cannot be treated prophylactically. However, they are treated postoperatively after resection of keloids which have not responded to surgery or other local measures alone. So the secondary indication would be a post-interventional radiotherapy option, which is scientifically not proven for certain Dipitra and Lederhose indications. It can be symptomatic for peyronie disease to relieve pain, and it can be adjuvant to surgery or symptomatic radiotherapy if no surgery performed. With regard to radiation therapy techniques, there are three different options available. In Dupiter and Lederhose, usually orthovoltaic x-rays are applied with 50 kV to up to 200 kV in deeper structures like Lederhose disease. Usually no bolus material is applied and lead rubber plates are used to protect uninvolved areas from radiation. In addition, in recent times, linear uh, electrons have been used with 3 to 9 MeV energies using lead cutouts um, due to the um, higher energy uh, with 2 centimeter lead cutouts. In Peyronie's disease, reports exist about the use of orthovoltage and linear electrons, while in keloids, also techniques using brachytherapy have been described in the literature. Important is today to integrate CT and MRT imaging into 3D radiotherapy planning. As with these imaging techniques, it is better possible to recognize the active disease and to individualize the radiotherapy planning to better target or protect structures. On the left side, the anatomical structure of the palmar aponeurosis is shown while the hypotenar and tenar muscles 
are never involved with Dipitra, as well as never the distal regions of the fingers. So fingernails and muscle areas should be protected from radiation. Also, very rarely, Dipitra involves the hand-wrist area. So the marked area is usually the area where 95% of Dipitra disease can occur with some, uh, some possible involvement of fingers up to the dip joint. On the middle graph, you can see a typical example of a man with an involvement bilateral with the left hand being involved with the thumb to the small finger, so D1 to D5 area, while the right hand is only involved from D5 to D2, and the thumb is uninvolved. Typically, a field of 10 or 12 centimeter lengths and with an angulation of about 60 degree will be sufficient to cover the D2 to D5 area, avoiding the wrist, avoiding the muscles, and avoiding the distal segments of the finger. On the other hand, uh, planning for letter host disease can show more involvement in MRI images due to perfusional changes. Uh, Professor Wolfson will present in this webinar his results for prognostic planning. The chance of using CT and MRI fusion provides us with the option to bet better individualize our treatment instead of doing rectangular fields or probability um, presentations. Again, looking at the different techniques, the question now arises, are these techniques equal and do they provide equal results? If they are properly applied, usually these techniques should present us with similar clinical results. However, the setup appears much more simple in the orthovoltage setting with a cone being mechanically put down on the foot while here a whole table and a whole machine has to be moved and approached so setup usually takes a little bit longer time on the linear accelerator than in the orthovolt machine here you can see the different depths, isodose depths curves for different energies. And with regard to electrons and orthovolt energies, the depth structures are pretty similar with some differences in the first one to two centimeters with some lower doses at the surface for electrons and with higher doses at some other depth structures. So usually the compensation is possible is adding additional bolus material of 5 to 10 millimeters to shape the penetration depth in electrons, uh, while in other voltage only the energy can be raised to get deeper penetration. Here you can see that in both there was both techniques like auto voltage, four centimeter penetration depth can be reached with 200 kV while it can also be reached with electrons. So penetration depths up to four centimeters can be equally physically and clinically provided to any patient with superficial fibromatosis, benign fibromatosis. And so if correctly applied, no differences should be seen when we compare electrons versus orthovolt x-rays. However, the costs are significant. The usual machine, also voltage machine, is a tenth of the price we have to pay for a linear accelerators. However, this machine is usually used in a much higher range of indications. In terms of clinical evidence and state of the art of radiotherapy, a comparison of PubMed um, clinical studies for lederhose in the 50 year area from 1970 to 2020 provides. Uh, results from 17 studies. For Jupiter in the same period, 117 studies. 
for Peyronie's disease, 80 studies, and to a big surprise, keloids, far more than 500 studies. So the evidence actually should be best in keloids. However, no randomized studies have been provided here. Randomized studies are ongoing now in Australia. Martin Gerard will report about it and in the Netherlands regarding letterhose disease. And uh, Dr. Stenbergers will tell us about his results. Uh, in Germany, uh, in 1996, a quasi-randomized study uh, was started with a control group compared with a randomized group of 21 to 30 grade, which was published in 2001. A long-term outcome trial has been uh, provided by Erlangen, Essen and Offenbach clinics. And there are numerous phase one, two trials. Peyronie's has, and keloids have no controlled uh, randomized studies and no double-blind randomized studies. However, some few large areas, for example, from Rotterdam, Netherlands, and many large series for keloids have been performed in the past. So clinical evidence would be difficult to prove with a randomized study, while evidence has grown already in these indications. So coming to an evaluation of the level of evidence due to the lack of randomized studies, usually keloids and hypertrophic scars, the evidence for radiotherapy is in the level of 2B, Peyronie's 2 to 3, B to C, Dupuytra and Lederhose in the level of 2 to 3, B and C. In terms of our probability to see those patients in Germany, we can look for the Decro patterns of scare study, which looked into the number of patients being treated in Germany, and about 40% of the institutions submitted their data of about 36,000 patients, um, generalizing that about 100,000 patients are treated in Germany for non malignant disorders. And of those 4%, which would mean about 4,000 patients may be treated for hyperproliferative disorders, with the majority being Dupuytren disease, Lederhose disease, keloids, and other disorders. So from these frequencies, we can expect that the probability to have those treatments in Europe and worldwide should be in the thousands, and it is worthwhile to look for new evidence to bring these indications forward to other uh, societies and to other areas in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Segan Smith. Okay, Dr. Segan Smith, the first question is around Dupertrans and Lederhose. Uh, do you sometimes omit the second course of treatment and why? Very interesting. COVID-19 has made it necessary to omit radiation sometimes for 9 to 12 months. And it was interesting to see that the first uh, progressions in some patients occurred after six months. So probably it is possible to have the second series even later than three months. However, in our uh, experience in Essen and uh, in other sites in Hamburg was clearly that about 40 to 50 percent of patients with only one series will require a second series due to progression. So it is not recommended to avoid the second series. Okay, thank you. Next question um, is around what role do you see for MV photons? Um, usually, Dupuytren is treated by six MV photons. Uh, we have the lead cutouts, which have a thickness of about two centimeter, and we are sometimes using five or 10 millimeter bolus to um, adapt the penetration depths. Uh, when you do CT scanning of the hand, you see that only about one third of the thickness of the hand in the central part of the hand needs to be irradiated. So we want to avoid as much dose to the backside of the hand. 
Okay, next question. We have time for a couple more questions because we have a very full agenda today. So two, two more questions. Um, for those of you who have submitted questions that we won't be able to answer, we'll make sure to connect you to Dr. Shegan Schmidt offline. Um, next question is, what is your referral pattern? Who refers to you for benign radiotherapy and how do you provide follow-up back to the referring team? Uh, usually referrals are to my uh, practice and to Osnabrück uh, uh, nationwide and even international wide, um, mostly uh, one third to one half of the patient will not be treated right away, but will be followed up until we see progression. And uh, if we treat, we usually treat within three to four months, a second series. And after that, after three months and 12 months, we do a three months early evaluation and a 12 months late evaluation. And from then on, we can do the email um, follow-up with follow-up forms, which are sent to the patient and sent back. Or we even offer video consultation to patients if they request this, just for first evaluation. Okay, great. Final question. You mentioned Garrett's disease, but didn't mention its treatment. Is it the same as with Dupertrons with the two series of five times three gray, or is there another treatment for it? Uh, my experience over 25 years with Garrett's disease is not very successful. Uh, overall, the procedure nowadays would be to treat only Garrett's disease nodules, which are painful, are symptomatic. We then give just one series and observe if they do respond. A response would be just pain release, but not size reduction. And uh, in some other cases, we ask patients to get the nodules removed and then do post-op radiotherapy, just one series. We will not give two series to have the option to treat a second time later in the lifeline. Okay, thank you. And again, thank you, Dr. Shegan Smith, for chairing this uh, section of thank our you. conference. We really are grateful for your participation and for organizing this great group of speakers today. I'm gonna go ahead and just in the essence of time, go ahead and move on to the next uh, presenter who uh, will be uh, Dr. Uh, Jared Martin, who will be speaking on radiation therapy for Dupertrans, the Australian DEPART study experience. Thanks to Extral for um, sponsoring this um, great initiative, which I think has been uh, really helpful for um, helping just to improve the literacy um, about these, this, these emerging um, indications for radiation um, and benign diseases. So my name's Jared Martin. I'm a radiotherapy specialist um, in Australia. You'll see I've branded myself for this talk as a radiation physician because I really do see myself as a uh, doctor with expert at using expertise at using radiotherapy to help a wide range of uh, people, including people with cancer, but also people with benign conditions. And just in case you're uh, wondering what kind of uh, horrible place of the world we live in Australia, this is um, my suburb. Uh, I live sort of on the left-hand side in one of the buildings, and um, in the front, in the foreground, is one of the five beaches I have within uh, 15 minutes walk. So you can all feel very sorry for the for the tough life we live down here in Australia. Just to give a quick overview of uh, Jupiter's disease, it's one of these hyperproliferative conditions with um, excessive fibroblasts attracted to the fascia just under the skin of the, uh, of the hands. The, um, it's, it sort of has a um, well understood natural history. It starts off in a nodular phase, which is really very proliferative with a lot of fibroblasts forming classically in the palm, but can occasionally be in the digits. Over time, and, and this is quite common in uh, Northern European populations, probably between 15 to 20% of people will have some sign of this early stage of the disease. Over time, the, um, some collagen will be laid down and you'll get to the cording phase. People often mistake this as being something affecting the tendons or the tendon sheaths, which are all actually completely anatomically normal. This is actually the fascia and the, uh, the anatomical arrangement of the fascial fibers um, coming to prominence. So this is kind of applied anatomy for radiation uh, specialists to understand that this is not a, an issue with the tendons. And from our point of view, that's part of the reason why when we treat this condition, we only need to be delivering the radiotherapy dose just below the skin rather than all the way down to the tendons or any deeper. Um, 
And then the more advanced phase is when you end up with contractures and these um, collagen shortens over time and can lead to functional deficits. But probably one of the most important things to note that only a minority of people who start with the nodular phase will end up with a contracture. And, and the estimates vary, but it is probably somewhere closer to the 1% of the population. So the, the vast majority of people with nodules aren't, actually aren't going to run into any problems um, in the medium term. And just thinking what's going on in the fascia, that's obviously a, a lot of lot of cells. But from our point of view, the main culprits are these fibroblasts. And obviously they're a normal, physiologically necessary uh, cell, cellular component of our um, extracellular matrix. Uh, but the problem with Jupitertron's disease is because of the genetic predisposition that they're abnormally attracted to the, uh, the fascia of the palm and they're abnormally um, overactive, which can lead to um, excessive collagen deposition. Radiotherapy has been explored for many years uh, for Jupitertron's disease, mainly in the early phases to stop people going from the nodular phase through to the uh, contracture phase. But as I sort of mentioned, the, the vast majority of people aren't going to actually end up with a contracture and this uncertain natural history about the pace of um, advancement, whether it's going to advance at all or whether it moves at intermittent paces where it might speed up and slow down over time, really means that there might be a lot of people that we treat early on who may not actually need um, treatment. Sometimes these nodules can be quite uncomfortable, but classically within three to six months that discomfort will settle. And once again, you could apply some radiation to help with as an anti-inflammatory intervention and then claim credit for success of uh, something that was going to settle down by itself. We do have the advantage to be able to manage most of the, uh, the fascia. I mean, the fascia is a complex structure, but we can manage really a lot of it at once, um, which, which potentially can reduce problems from occurring in the future. And I guess ultimately what we're trying to do is stop more invasive treatments such as surgery or, or, or other approaches being necessary if someone does end up with a, uh, a contracture down the track. Now there's a lot of enthusiasm for the use of radiotherapy in Jupitron's disease and in fact this um, Facebook group has um, over 5,000 uh, members and a very active conversation. And really what, what, what you pick up from all this is that there's a lot of people just looking for, for answers and options, particularly in the early phase. And, uh, and, and radiotherapy has some runs on the board to potentially be able to help out in that regard. However, a lot of the evidence for radiotherapy is generally uh, retrospective, uh, single institution um, and, and non-randomized. And particularly for a disease with uncertain natural history or an unpredictable natural history, you really do need a, a randomized control arm to get the credibility uh, for your results. Now, Professor Shigelsmith was the uh, initiator of the, the, the major clinical trial uh, which did randomise between two doses of radiotherapy. Um, the control arm, however, was uh, was, was non-randomised, and for this reason, the um, a lot of international bodies um, really haven't um, embraced radiation um, for the prevention of um, Jupitron's disease um, progression over time. And in fact, the uh, the British guidelines really say that you really need to be doing this as part of some sort of um, research or um, uh, enterprise um, moving forward rather than being bracing as a standard approach. And I guess we're reminded that the importance of randomized trials recently because uh, radiotherapy has been used uh, for other benign conditions and this is for osteoarthritis and the Dutch actually did do a, um, a sham radiation randomized trial where half the patients got uh, radiation the other half the patients got sham radiation and both the oncologists and the um, um, uh, patients were blinded as to whether they got treated or not. And um, there's a lot of lot to unpack with this study as with any other, but I guess the take home message is that around about 30 to 40% of people got some sort of pain relief, whether they got placebo or, or radiation, which is actually kind of what you, what you would expect in any um, subjective endpoint um, for a clinical trial, that placebo effect of around 30% is very widely accepted. Um, and really no difference between the radiotherapy group or the sham group, um, you know, really raising questions about um, whether this should be um, widely delivered treatment moving forward without further research. I guess on the flip side, there are some risks with any medical intervention, but in the short term, the risks from radiotherapy, given that we're giving a relatively low dose of radiation, tend to be quite low. Now, you can get some skin redness, um, if, you know, fancy medical term, epidemic erythema. Um, 
a little bit of a dry hand, it's often not bone dry, and we do go to effort to not um, treat the uh, the pulp at the end of the fingers, so you can still have uh, a little bit of grip from the um, from the sweat glands there. But the thing we all worry about is second malignancies. However, we do try to risk manage that by only treating older patients who are at lower risk. Um, it's a peripheral area that isn't near any particularly radiosensitive structures in this regard. Small field, uh, and the doses are much lower. And overall, the estimate is somewhere up to about between one in 5,000 to one in 1,000 risk. That's um, quite conservative, and that's on a back background of a one in four risk of just getting a cancer anyway, spontaneously in the environment. So in absolute terms, it's only making a relatively small increased risk. But it's not zero. So this is not a patient with Jupitrons, but a man who was treated over 40 years previously for excessive sweating of the palms, and he ended up with a squamous cell carcinoma in the palm, which was been neglected and, and got, got very advanced. Uh, this is the only case I'm aware of, of uh, radiation for a benign condition to the um, hands leading to a second cancer out of presumably many, many thousands that have been treated. But I guess we can accept that um, patients really do need to be counseled about uh, you know, keeping an eye on things uh, moving forward and, and, and acting early if they did notice any problems. So because of all of these issues, we have launched a randomized trial uh, looking at the use of radiotherapy in Jupitron's disease. And we reverse engineer the uh, acronym DEPART about evaluating um, the use of radiation both in the preventative and the adjuvant um, settings. So the way it works is that we're looking for 372 um, hands with, with people with early stage progressive uh, Jupitron's disease. And by early stage, I mean that the contracture has to be less than 10 degrees because once you've got a lot of collagen laid down, that is acellular and it's not going to be affected by, uh, by the use of radiation. Um, and they have to have some tempo to the disease. So progression over the last 12 months and ideally over six months. The, um, the people that come in and, and for assessment who've had stable disease for many years or they've just noticed disease that may have been present previously, but um, They've got no real time frame on it. We, we tend to counsel um, to continue observing rather than um, embarking on this trial. And as I say, we tend to not treat um, treat young people age limit of 30. Um, but the, and then the main the randomization is between standard approach, which is observation, versus 10 sessions of radiotherapy with around six week uh, break in the middle. But though there is a bit of flexibility there, and in between four to 12 weeks is acceptable. And the primary endpoint is really borrowed from a lot of the um, surgical and uh, collagenase studies in uh, Jupitron's disease that if they end up needing to have a salvage definitive intervention or they develop a greater than 20 degree contracture um, that counts as um, progression. The um, follow-up is quite strict we've outsourced it to hand therapists who do measurements every six to nine months over the following five years there's a lot of patient reported uh, questionnaires toxicity assessments and we're really just trying to get a really complete understanding both of the risks and benefits, if, if any, of the use of radiotherapy in this condition. I'll also mention that we are also looking in the adjuvant setting. So this is when people have had a contracture and they've had that uh, an intervention to straighten it out. Uh, the gold set standard um, is, is some sort of surgical fasciectomy and there's obviously a few ways that can be approached. Up until recently, we had collagenase um, injections, um, which, which kind of sort of like almost like an acid that burnt away some of the um, collagen but that's um, no longer available out of uh, North America so that arm is um, unfortunately going to need to close um, and there's also a needle aponeurotomy where uh, which is also a sort of a, a relatively minimally invasive uh, procedure as well done under local anesthetic um, however all of these have some relapse risk and, and, and the numbers are a little bit rubbery but probably somewhere between one and four and one and two people depending on the intervention are going to um, relapse over, over a five-year period. So a lot of these treatments, they really sort of seem to be managing the condition rather than curing the condition. Now radiotherapy has been used for other um, hyperproliferative um, conditions such as uh, heterotopic ossification, uh, particularly around the hip, um, or keloids, which are also being discussed at this uh, these webinar series. And so there are some runs on the board that uh, radiation used in other sites may actually dampen down um, um, the fibroblast proliferation that may lead to disease progression in, in Jupitrons as well. So that's really what we're exploring on the adjuvant aspects of the study. So very similar design as the uh, previous slide. Uh, people who've had any um, local treatment 
um, and have had some degree of, um, of flattening out of their hand um, to less than 10 degree contracture upwards. So that's, the procedure needs to be a success. And then afterwards, they just get randomized between observation, which is really, of course, all the hand therapy and splinting and, and, and other necessary wound management as well. And then arm two takes all of that and adds on exactly the same radiotherapy um, as in the prevention arm, but with um, a very close uh, follow-up and, um, uh, and exactly the same endpoints. And anecdotally, um, this is one person coming in for their second um, course of radiotherapy. The right hand had just standard surgery followed without radiotherapy. The left hand had surgery without any radiotherapy and the, the scar was, was healing very well on, on the left, left hand and um, uh, the skin was very supple. And this is another lady who had um, a, a Brunner's scar on the uh, left uh, fifth digit, which my surgeon will claim was because of her expertise. It's disappeared, but she also had some radiotherapy afterwards as well. So we're getting some early reassurances as a tolerable management. Uh, we run a Jupitrons clinic in Newcastle, which has had over 400 patients come through it over the last couple of years with a mixture of hand surgeons, radiation, radiation physicians, and a hand therapist. And Tanya Burgess, um, second from the right, has been the real driving force of this. And we usually get about 16 patients coming through each of these clinics where we um, um, assess them, educate them, uh, discuss with them the clinical trial, um, and, and get very positive feedback from the patients about, um, about the experience. Just my last couple of slides, the, um, the trials are accruing well. We've opened now in uh, a bunch of centres in Australia with another couple coming up and hoping to open in uh, Groningen um, in the next couple of months as well. And then, um, and most interestingly, we've actually found Facebook um, ads to be the most um, useful way of, uh, of, of making people aware of this, this study as well, but we're using a whole bunch of approaches. So just my final slide, um, we do need to generate some high quality evidence for the use of radiotherapy for any indication. Um, we're almost certain to reach our prevention cruel in the next uh, uh, couple of years. Um, the adjuvant arms are just getting off the ground. Uh, we really want to expand the culture of radiation to embrace, embrace benign diseases and really have a platform for future trials. There's a cast of thousands um, that I really got to acknowledge as helping out um, with, with all of this. And uh, really, I look forward to um, uh, help, helping patients move, 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 the, move the needle in the right direction moving forward. Um, I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to take any questions, but um, hopefully we'll be able to continue to correspond in the future. I thank you all for your attention. All right, thank you to Dr. Martin. Again, as I mentioned, he has pre-recorded his session um, as he is in Australia and is, is probably asleep. So. <laughs> Um, with no further ado, I'd like to just keep the program moving. I'd like to introduce Dr. Roel Steenbachers. He will be speaking on radiation therapy for letter host disease, the Dutch randomized study experience. So uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Steenbachers. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, my name is Roel uh, Steenbachers. I'm a radiation oncologist from the Netherlands. Um, I would uh, like to thank the organization and uh, Extral to uh, give the opportunity to give this presentation. Uh, my presentation will be about radiation therapy for letter house disease, the Dutch randomized study experience. First of all, I do not have anything to disclose. And this is what I'm going to talk about. First, our experience in the Netherlands at the UMC Groningen. I will give you some update about the trials. I have some preliminary results and I will end with future perspectives. First, our experience in Groningen in the Netherlands. Uh, since 2008, we give radiation treatment for letter house disease. And uh, up to 2012, we uh, did use Ortovolt, and from 2012, uh, we did use, we do use electrons. Our treatment dose is uh, the standard 30 gray. Uh, we give two times 15 gray with a split around uh, uh, 10 weeks. And uh, our uh, standard field margins are depicted in the picture, uh, 25 millimeters in the distal to proximal. Uh, uh, direction and 50 millimeters with the lateral and medial uh, direction. There's quite some literature uh, about the radiation and 
letter host uh, disease as uh, depicted in this slide. I do not expect you to read it all, but there are three uh, studies performed in the past. Unfortunately, these, all these studies are uh, no randomized trials. For that reason, in the Netherlands, uh, radi radiation therapy for letter host disease is not reimbursed by the insurance companies since 2013. And they claim that due to la lack of scientific evidence for e efficacy of radiation. And therefore, there is a need for a randomized controlled trial. We, uh, until now, we performed two studies. The LEDGOT study, which is a multicenter phase three double blind randomized controlled trial, and the LEDGOT LTE study, uh, standing for long term effects of radiotherapy. These are the two studies which have been performed. And uh, first of all, I will talk about the LEDGOT long term uh, efficacy, efficacy uh, study which is a cross-sectional cohort study uh, about the long-term uh, effects, effects uh, on pain reduction, side effects, but also patient-rated outcome, uh, like satisfaction and a treatment burden. Uh, we collected 67 patients with lateral host disease in the uh, time point from 2008. And the data collection was be by means of questionnaires. From these uh, 67 patients, we included 102 uh, treated feet, uh, 28 males, 39 females, mean age uh, at the end of radiotherapy was 55 years. In the meantime, after treatment completion was five years. Uh, most patients also suffered from Dupuytren's disease, some males from Peyronie's disease. 50% uh, of the patients has a, a positive family history and uh, 13 patients uh, underwent surgery uh, prior to radiotherapy. And these were mainly the patients uh, in the beginning of the time when it was not known that uh, radiation was beneficial for these kind of patients. Some results, um, when we look at the pain score, uh, the mean the pain score prior to radiotherapy was 5.7. And uh, at the time of the assessment, so at the mean time of five years of radiation, the uh, pain score is uh, 1.7 and the difference is significant. When we look at the pain response, uh, we saw that uh, 42 feet had a complete pain response, uh, 38 feet had a partial pain response, 32 patients had a state pain response, and none of the patients had progressive pain. Some side effects, uh, 10 patients reported uh, dryness of the skin um, and two patients erythema of the, uh, of the skin and nine of the 10 patients reported dryness uh, after four years. Um, and therefore it seems that uh, dryness of the skin, if it appears that it will persist over time. Um, the evaluation of the treatment, 69% uh, uh, of the patients reported a permanent positive effect on the pain. 78% uh, of the patients were satisfied with the effect of the treatment. And 57% of the patients did not consider the, uh, the treatment burdensome. If you go to the uh, LEDRAT study, uh, uh, the LEDRAT study, as I said before, it's a multicenter phase three double blind randomized controlled trial. It consists of two treatment arms, a placebo and a uh, radiotherapy arm. And the placebo, uh, all the, uh, the treatment uh, was the same, uh, but uh, the patients were not actually irradiated. But we gave a sham irradiation. So patients were on the radiation machine. The patient did. Uh, uh, hear the radiation sound with, without actually being irradiated. The study was unblinded after 18 months after treatment. And the primary outcome of the study is pain relief at 12 months uh, using the numeric rating scale, the NRS. Secondary outcomes are pain relief at 6 and 18 months, quality of life, 
uh, nodule size depicted by ultrasound and MR, uh, walking abilities, uh, the 10 meter walking test, and also we used uh, 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 some sophistic uh, pressure uh, walking uh, ability to see whether patients had different uh, walking uh, issues. Um, and also cost effectiveness and economic evaluation and also safety and toxicity. The first patient was included in January 2018 and uh, 84 patients were included after 20 months. We did uh, think that it would last uh, for two years the inclusion but we uh, the inclusion was ended before uh, that date, so actually the inclusion went very well. Uh, very recently, in August 2021, the last patient was un unblinded and the data is complete. And we now started with the data analysis and I will show you soon some preliminary results. As I said, uh, we included 84 patients, uh, 130 feet were uh, in the study. Five patients were, uh, were dropouts prior to the, the uh, 80, 80 months follow-up. And the baseline characteristics were a uh, mean age of 56 years, uh, a little bit more females than males. Uh, the affected feet, uh, 25 only at the left, 13 only at the right, and 46, uh, both feet were uh, radiated. And the treatment arms were very nice balanced. Uh, 42 patients received a placebo, 42 patients the radiotherapy. And within the placebo arm uh, uh, and also radiotherapy arm, uh, the male and female ratio was uh, uh, the same. Um, what you see here is the, our main endpoint, the mean pain score. Um, what you see that at baseline, the, pain, the mean pain score for both groups was uh, around the same. Uh, after six months, uh, also the mean pain score at the placebo arm and also the therapy arm uh, reduced, uh, but the difference was not uh, significant. Um, at 12 months, at and at 18 months, the pain score, the mean pain score was different between the two uh, uh, the different arms. And uh, as you can see, the pain reduction uh, increased uh, over time with the radiotherapy arm and with the placebo, it uh, was more or less the same. Actually, we were quite surprised that there was a very large placebo effect uh, but fortunate uh, when, when the time was passing by, the placebo uh, effect was uh, diminishing. When we look at quality of life, uh, we saw um, that also at baseline, the quality of life score at the placebo arm and the radiotherapy arm was lower than the Dutch pop population. Um, and after six months, we saw a, a dramatic increase of quality of life score with the radiotherapy arm, but also at the, the placebo arm. And at the placebo arm, uh, it's uh, remained stable at 12 and 18 months. And uh, with the radiotherapy arm, it was uh, almost similar to the Dutch population, showing that uh, after radiotherapy, the quality of life score and the radiotherapy arm is similar to the Dutch population. Some future perspectives, uh, what I showed you were some preliminary results and uh, we are finalizing our analysis of the LEDRAP study, study and uh, we hope that we uh, very soon will publish uh, this. In case that it's indeed a positive uh, result, uh, we are going to convince the Dutch Healthcare Institute that radiation for letter hose sheet should be reimbursed which is currently not the case. And I think that our Dutch patients will be very happy when that it will be the, be the case. And uh, of course, we will further collect uh, data with a longer follow-up, uh, uh, looking at long-term effects uh, of treatment. That's what I wanted to present you. And uh, now I would uh, 
ask you if you have any questions. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Steenbacher. So uh, the first question for you, um, what is the timing of the US MRI assessment after treatment? Um, what, what, uh, um, if I understand the question correctly, what the timing of the, the ultrasound and the EMR is? is correct. That correct, yeah, the, the yeah. ultrasound and MRI assessment after treatment. Yeah, we did, uh, for every patient, we uh, do have an ultrasound and an MR uh, before the start of the treatment um, and after one year. Um, unfortunately, I do not have the results on, the, on that yet. Uh, but also, we have the impression that uh, ultrasound is a little bit more suitable uh, for evaluation, but that's uh, currently under investigation. Okay, um, next question. How do you place the time gap and dose in the two courses of radiation therapy? Um, actually, the, the, the time gap um, is based on uh, on the publications of, uh, of Sagan Smith, which um, have been advised to, uh, to put that on between six and 10 uh, weeks. And actually we did uh, choose to do that uh, on 10 weeks. And for all the patients, we did uh, use the, the same, so there was no uh, difference in gap. Uh, so we were very strict, uh, strict on that. Okay, thank you. And then final question, what was the dose um, schedule uh, of RT used in the lead rad study for letter host disease? What was the dose schedule of RT used? So for the, uh, for the, uh, we when they used uh, 30 gray, uh, so for in, in the first week, uh, we give uh, three times five gray, I waited for 10 weeks and then again, uh, uh, five times uh, three gray, if I uh, uh, say that correctly. So two times, uh, uh, two weeks of uh, five times three gray, so 30 gray in, in total. Uh, and of course, in the placebo arm, uh, no radiation was uh, was given. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that's all the time that we have for questions for you. But if, if any of you have additional questions for Dr. Steenbachers, please, just as with Dr. Martin, go ahead and submit them in the question panel, and we will make sure to get you guys in communication with each other. So. Our next speaker is Dr. Bernadette Eberlin. Um, she'll be speaking on radiation therapy for Peyronie's disease, the Munich Orthovoltage Experience. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Eberlin. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this talk. Pyrone disease or Induratio penis plastica is a connective tissue disorder with formation of fibrotic plaques in the pineal tunica albuginea. Typical symptoms, therefore, are induration, deviation, pain during sexual intercourse, and erectile dysfunction. Independence of the age and the geographic area, the estimated prevalence varies between 3 to 11 percent. The etiology of the disease is not clear, but microtraumas of the penal tunica albuginea um, are assumed to initiate the fibrosis. The acute phase of Peyronie's disease can be treated by different non-surgical treatment options like drugs, enzymes, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, and what is the topic today, radiotherapy. In a late stable phase, surgical treatments are recommended. It was the aim of the study to assess the safety, the efficacy and satisfaction of an ultravolt X-ray therapy in Peyronie's disease. Now for the study which took place several years ago, we used the Dermopan 2 device. And since 2017, we have the x 100. You see that aluminum filters had been put here on the top of the tubes, whereas with the new extra 100, the aluminum filters are included. 
For the treatment of perine disease, you need lead protection for gonads. And we have here a wooden board with lead here in the middle. Additionally, for the exact irradiation, uh, you need a lead cutout protection, a smaller one. And we additionally use salon filter. This is a two millimeter plastic shield in order to protect the skin from, from side effects. Now, as I already told you, we used the Dermopan 2 device, and this device has a 50 kilovolt photons at 25 milliamperes. The X um, Strahl device has 17 milliamperes. We used a one millimeter aluminum filter. The tube was four centimeter diameter and a focus skin distance of 15 centimeters. Our protocol is a protocol yes, established for decades um, in dermatology units. And we use a total dose of 32 gray with two fractions per week, each four gray with an eight weeks interval. We also use this protocol for marble stipula and marble letter hose. Now the study was a, ret a retrospective questionnaire analysis of 234 patients with Pyronese disease who underwent the radiation therapy between 1999 and 2008. And the questionnaire included questions about family history, comorbidities, disease characteristics, treatments, effects and side effects, as well as satisfaction. Now, only one third of the patients sent back the questionnaire. And here you see with the yellow bars, the age distribution of all the patients. And here with the blue bars, the one who took place in the study and send us back the questionnaires. And here the mean follow-up time was over four years with a range between eight to 98 months. One third of the patients had a coincidence with other benign fibroproliferative disorders, mainly Dipitran disease. And as expected, the most common clinical symptoms were deviation, plug induration and pain during an erection. Now here are the overall results after the therapy in these 83 patients. About half of the patients reported on a regression of symptoms after therapy and only 1% um, reported on recurrence of symptoms. About one third of the patients had a positive impact on the sexual life after the therapy. And I think this is a very good result. Almost 80% uh, reported on um, improvement and no progression of the Peyronie's disease. And the effect was more pronounced in younger patients under the age of 61 years. Now, if we look at single symptoms, uh, we can say that in half of the patients, there was a regression on deviation and in 36% a stabilization. Only 7% reported on a progression on deviation. Similar results were found uh, for the effects on induration. Here, 24% reported on a regression and 25% on stabilization. Also here, only 7% uh, had a progression. The best results uh, were found for the symptom pain. And um, of course, not all patients had pain before the therapy, but 70%, over 70% of the patients having pain before had a relief. In 11%, we had a stabilization and only in 1% a progression. And here you see uh, really the good results with regard to the symptom pain. 
As already mentioned, about one third mentioned a positive effect on the sexual life, about half said there was no effect, and we have no data for 11%. Now, what about the side effects? We had in 40% an erythema and in 10% a dryness of the treated area as acute side effects. And if you look at the chronic side effects, we found in 12% angiectasia and skin atrophy in 10%. And what about the satisfaction of the patients with the therapy? Here you see a visual on a log scale uh, from dissatisfaction to very satisfaction to a very satisfaction. And um, on average, there was a score of 6.2 points with a median of seven points. So more patients were satisfied than dissatisfied. And I think the dissatisfaction is, is due to the um, uh, problem that the induration and the deviation was not improved in all patients. Now, if we compare our results here in the last row with the literature dating back to the 70s, we see uh, that um, the improvement of the pain was in most cases about around 70 and up to 85 percent. The improvement of deviation and induration uh, was not so good, and you see uh, less effects. To conclude, we can say radiotherapy is a safe therapy and an effective therapy, we have no progression in almost 80% and a regression in almost half of the patients, and most patients were satisfied. Um, I want to also mention the DECRO guidelines for the radiotherapy of this disease. Here, total dose, a total dose of up to 20 gray in a daily single fractions of two to three gray is recommended. We had a little bit higher doses, but altogether we can say the application of radiotherapy in peronese disease is possible and particularly effective in early stages of the disease. And at the end, I want to thank all the co-workers who were involved in this study, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Eberlein. Um, we'd like to open up the Q&A now um, for your presentation. Um, yes. Yes, great, fantastic. Um, the first question for you, Dr. Eberlein, is there a study comparing different radiation protocols? So as far as I know, and I, I looked through the literature, uh, I did not found any uh, comparative studies. Maybe one study back in 1975 comparing uh, uh, one radiation uh, with 10 grays to with two radiations up to 20 grays, but there was no difference and, and maybe the total dose is too low. I think, um, yes, this is necessary in analogy to the study of the Morbus Lederhose to do really placebo-controlled um, studies. Okay, thank you. Next question, why was 50 kV used rather than a higher and, and more penetrating kV dose? Yes, uh, the Dermopan 2 um, device is, yes, a device uh, from the 60s and 70 years, and we had this over the last centuries, and this device does only have this 50 kilowatts. But now we use, uh, with the extra, you can use a higher dose, of course, in analogy to Morbus Lederhose and Morbus Dubita. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have a full schedule today, so but we have time for one more additional question. Um, this is regarding side effects. How did you handle side effects? Okay, of course, uh, um, the patients 
can put on uh, some steroid creams if the erythema is um, very prominent, but usually um, yes, normal ointments uh, are recommended. So it's not a big problem for the patients. Okay, this is a follow-up that I will ask you because it is specific to the urethema. Um, do you recommend a 20 gray dose to decrease the urethema associated with the, the higher 32 gray dose? Yes, that's also possible, yes. Okay, great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and continue on um, today's session. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Franz Rodell. He will be speaking on the radiobiological principles of treatment of benign fibromatosis. Um, and thank you again, Dr. Uh, Rodell, for participating in this session. We look forward to your presentation. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers and Xtral to provide me the opportunity to briefly review on radiological principles in the treatment of benign fibromatosis. Due to restricted time, I would like to concentrate on Dubitrans contracture, which covers a prime example of a fibroproliferative disease with contractile properties. As given in the webcast series, low-dose radiation therapy is reasonable, effective in reducing or abolish the clinical symptoms of morbus Dubitrans and other hyperproliferative diseases. The radiobiological basis and molecular or cellular mechanisms contributing to the modulation of this benign hyperproliferative fibromatosis disorders, however, are far from being fully explored. This talk thus aims to summarize current concepts on the anti-proliferative and immune modulating properties of low-dose radiation exposure. Apparent cell proliferation is involved in the hyperproliferative tissue formation, which is induced by either a genius unknown reason, by secondary injury, or by a variety of trigger mechanisms. In general, the cause of Dubitrans disease comprises three consecutive phases, which are associated with a different radiation responsiveness. First, a radiosensitive hyperproliferative initial phase characterized by increased numbers of fibroblast, myofibroblast, and early nodal and cord formations um, is evident. Second, the, an in volumental phase with a decreased radiation sensitivity in line with the established of fiber bundles resulting in contractures is evident. And finally, a non-radiation sensitive residual phase with collagen fibers dominating the uh, connective tissue is present. Consequently, the national for the use of ionizing radiation to affect this hyperproliferative disorders may be related to the presence of radiation sensitive target cells like mitotic fibroblast, myofibroblast, and molecular mechanisms at the early stage of disease. With regard to radiation responsive target cells, the proliferative phase seems to be the most relevant, as is mainly driven by radiation sensitive fibroblasts and mu fibroblasts prior to the formation of nodular constructures. In response to fibrogenic cytokines, most pronounced transforming growth factor beta 1 released by inflammatory cells, fibroblasts differentiate into myofibroblast. This process results in proliferation, excessive production, and matrix deposition of extracellular components, most prominent collagen, fibronectin, elastin, and proteoglycans, and the development of nodules and cords. The cellular sources of this Meyer fibroblast are still not entirely clear. They may, however, include resistant or cyclite. CD43 positive stem cell like fibroblast progenitor cells or may derive from parasites endothelial cells or epithelial cells with a letter to include a mechanism of epithelial mesenchymal transition. 
There is still few literature on the impact of ionizing radiation on the fibroblast, myofibroblast, and fibrocyte system. In the late 80s, based on morphological and proliferative characteristics, Bayreuther and Rodeman defined a differentiation sequence of a fibroblast fibrocyte cell system with terminally differentiated senescence or post mitotic fibrosis to display the final step of differentiation. These post mitotic cells are characterized by a down regulation of CFOS and a specific capacity for the synthesis of collagen types 1, 3, and 5 in proteoglycans. Taken into account these sequences, single dose irradiation of fibroblast in the dose range of 1 to 8 gray induces terminal differentiation into post mitotic fibrocytes at a high percentage level, while irradiation of long-term cultures with fractionated doses revealed a less marked reduction of fibroblast proliferative activity. Further, these effects are more pronounced at the early onset of radiation. Moreover, the lifespan of senescent fibrocytes is limited and shortened by approximately 40% if induced by ionizing radiation as compared to a physiological development. Following environmental stress, including ionizing radiations, levels of reacting oxygen species, including hydrogen pyroxide or hydroxyl radicals, increased dramatically, resulting in a significant damage of cellular macromolecules, induction of DNA damage, and disturbances of a multitude of signal transduction pathways. The latter directly affect the production of inflammatory and fibrogenic cytokines, including activation of latent transforming growth factor beta. In sum, these cytokines act as chemoattractants, mitogens, and differentiation inducers for the fibroblast, myofibroblast, fibrocyte system. Notably, as depicted in the graph, addition of three oxygen radicals to cultured fibroblasts from Dubitrans palma fascia dose dependently either increases or inhibit proliferation at lower and higher concentration. Thus, Elevated level of ROS induced by ionizing radiation may exceed a threshold of ROS production to, inhib to inhibit uh, fibroblasts and myofibroblast proliferation. Indeed, elevated levels of growth factor cytokines produced by platelets, macrophages, and other cell types, including myofibroblasts, have been reported in tubitrans specimens. By this, elevated levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines were observed in fibroblast cultures isolated from Dubitrans nodules as compared to normal plama fascia. These factors include, among others, fibroblast growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, epidermal growth factor, connective tissue factor, isotypes of transforming growth factor beta, and tumor necrosis factor Alpha. Among these mediators, TGF beta is well recognized to constitute a key player as the cytokine is critical in many facets of the fibrogenic process, such as rust generation and the synthesis of extracellular matrix components. Although the onset and progression of Dubitens constructor has have extensively been investigated. Um, the mechanisms, the mechanistic basic for the proliferation elements is still not complete results. However, the process includes at least two differentiation components, a fibrogenic, anguinic, proliferative, and an inflammatory and immune cell component. Indeed, histological studies identified the presence of a multitude of immune cells in early dubitrans structure. In particular, the number of macrophages correlated with the quantity of myofibroblast. As given in the picture, macrophage is characterized by service CD86 service CD68 expression are localized in alpha smooth muscle actin positive uh, myofibroblast nodules and their localization correlates with an increased detection of cytokines like TGF beta 1 and pro-inflammatory interleukin 6 in nodal tissue.
on a mechanistic level, resting macrophages are activated, for instance, by injury or stretch, and in turn secrete elevated levels of a variety of cytokines, including interleukins, chemokines, and TGF beta. These mediators will, on the one hand, activate additional macrophages. On the other hand, these cytokines will impact on fibroblastomy, fibroblast differentiation, and proliferation that is further augmented by myofibroblasts, interleukin 1, TNF alpha, and growth factor expression. Thus, a direct interrelationship between ionizing radiation and macrophage activation may constitute an additional mode of action. Indeed, with regard to cytokine production, a hampered pro-inflammatory TNF-alpha or interleukin-1 secretion from human or immune macrophages stimulated by lipopolysaccharide has been reported. In addition, inflammatory macrophages irradiated with low doses exhibit a reduced oxidative burst capacity and diminished activity of inducible nitric oxide synthase um, expression resulting in reduced levels of ROS mounting in oxidative burst or nitric oxide production. Taking into consideration the prominent role of macrophages in both inflammatory and fibro genic processes, a diminished production of cytokines, ROS and NO may further contribute to reduced myofibroblast proliferation activation and to the beneficial effects of radiation therapy. It has further been shown that a therapeutic benefit of steroids in early dubitrans contracture may be due to a diminished look site recruitment. In line with that, endothelial cells are crucially involved in the regulation of inflammatory processes, both by a local recruitment of immune cells from the peripheral blood and their capacity to secrete a multitude of cytokines and growth factors. Applying adhesion assays, we and others have reported on the reduction of leukocyte adhesion to 50% of the control levels at 4 hours and 24 hours after a low-dose X-ray um, exposure. In addition, we observed an increased ROS production from stimulated endothelial cells with a local maximum following a 0.5 gray exposure. Based on these findings, it is reasonable to assume that a reduced recruitment of immune component cells like monocytes or macrophages may further contribute to the anti proliferative and functional effects of radiation in the treatment of morbus depitran. In summary, people proliferative disorders are based on complex pathophysiological networks and considered to comprise a system biological disease. Accordingly, one may assume that the empirical proven benefit effect of low-dose radiation therapy is mediated by a modulation of a multitude of cellular of components of radiation therapy is mediated Although by a considerable process of has been achieved during the last decade in the understanding of radiobiological mechanisms being prominent at a low-dose radiation exposure, still a multitude of open questions exist. Thus, intensive translational and clinical research efforts, as well as the development of further basic preclinical models, are seriously needed to unravel additional contributing factors and mechanisms. And by this statement, I'd like to thank you for your attention and would be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Rodell. Um, so uh, the first question coming in from, from the team, um, why do you think that there is not more radiation therapy being used for hyperproliferative disorders? This question is hardly to be answered because I think in Germany and in other countries, uh, lotus radiotherapy for hyperproliferative diseases is an established treatment in a variety of, uh, of diseases. However, in England or in other countries, the use of lotus radiotherapy um, is somehow uh, regarded with, with danger uh, by, uh, by the people that think that um, they might have a cancer risk by, by treatment. And therefore, um, it's, uh, they do not dare to 
um, to, uh, to perform treatment with, with this low dose radiotherapy in, in, in a, lot of, a lot of countries. However, to my point of view, um, this, this treatment is not so dangerous as I thought, and the incidences and the, the fear of, of inducing cancer is neglectable by the doses that we use in this low dose radiotherapy. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question uh, is just an observation that it seems that the lower dose per fraction lower than three gray worked in the cell experiments. Do you think that three gray is too much? Um, concerning Morbus Dubertrain, it's quite difficult to answer this question because we need two components in the treatment. We need uh, immune proliferative, uh, immune modulating uh, activity, which is mainly covered by a dose of 0.53, and we use another uh, higher doses for the uh, to impact on the proliferation of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. So I think we need this higher doses to scope with the proliferative activity of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, and uh, we also need uh, lower doses in the surrounding of, of this of this um, diseases for for the uh, for the modulation of the immune system, this is also implicated in, in, in the progression of the disease. Okay, thank you. Um, last question regarding um, sort of the age of the patients that you are, are you're using radiotherapy. Is there a, an age uh, that you, you know, I guess, would not recommend treatment for someone um, younger than a certain age? So Emma referred to the guidelines of the German DECRO uh, and uh, um, society, and they recommended not to treat patients uh, younger than 40 years. Okay, um, and we do have one final question. Um, there hasn't been much literature demonstrating secondary malignancy for dupotrins or keloids. Do you think that there's a particular study that you would cite for your patients um, in terms of secondary malignancies? So to the best of my knowledge, there's indeed no literature and no um, particular study on, on, on this special topic. So we really had to refer to, to more general uh, publication from um, Professor Trott, for example, dealing with uh, the cancer risk of low-dose radiotherapy, which was published a, a, a couple of years ago. Okay, thank you very much. Um, like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Al uh, Oliver Mick, who will be speaking on multi-center patterns of care study quality assurance for radiotherapy of benign disorders. Uh, welcome, Dr. Mick. Thank you for the organizers and thank you to Ixtra for the possibility to talk today and to give you a small talk on this uh, theoretic but very important topic. My name is Oliver Micke and I'm a radiation oncologist from Bielefeld in uh, Germany and I will talk today on the topic of quality assurance for radiotherapy of benign disorders. What is quality? The term quality is defined as a degree to which a set of inherent characteristics of an object fulfills requirement. And note that degree implies quality is a variable. And second, a set of implies quality is not a single characteristic. And inherent is opposed to assigned. And object means anything perceivable and conceivable and requirement means a need or an expectation that is stated, generally imply or obligatory. So for what now are the pattern of care studies? What is the main topic of my talk? It gives us the impression of the clinical treatment, of the range of the clinical treatment. And the philosophy behind is that a better structure and a better process result in a better outcome. And down here, you see uh, a picture of one of the fathers of this idea, that is Dona Bedian. And pattern of care studies are for the continuous evaluation of quality. And they assess three dimensions. 
that means structure, process, and outcome. Looking back to history, the patterns of care study is initiated by the NCI under the direction of Simon Kramer in 1973. Afterwards, in the late 80s and beginning 90s, it was established in the United States. And in the 90s, there was an expansion and the definition of the standard of care. And after that begins, began the international application. But primarily, this pattern of care studies focus in malignant diseases like endometrial cancer, cervical cancer, head and neck, breast cancer, some treatment planning, esophageal cancer, Hodgkin's disease, prostate and rectal cancer and so on and so on. And Simon Kramer defined that the function of patterns of care studies is to improve the quality and the accessibility of radiation care in the United States. But today we talked not only of, about the United States, but on the international application. But they seek to establish how and by whom radiation therapy is being practiced and to evaluate the factors which affect the levels of care presently being delivered. And here are the different components of the pattern of care studies. The three components, structure, process, and outcome. Structure means equipment and personal process, action to evaluate and treat patient, and outcome, the special results for the patient. And how we measure measurements for structure facility survey, for the process process survives, and for the outcome outcome survives or long term follow ups. And how can we define the standard of care? We see that structure and process um, have a strong interaction and process and outcome, and the outcome influences the structure finally. But you have to keep, keep in mind only structure and process can be influenced. And how is the method of the pattern of care study? How we did it in Germany is a, is a standardized procedure. We sent standardized questionnaires to all German radiation institutions asking for patient accrual, number of patients, disease history number and type of pretreatments, resection status, treatment indication, target volume concept, the radiation treatment concept, and clinical outcome power. Here you see an example of such a questionnaire. We try to keep it short and simple. This is in German, that is clear. Now, what is the patterns of scare study? It is established in malignant disease. But what about non-malignant benign disorders? So far, we completed 12 different patterns of care studies. You see some of the examples here. And some of the results I like to present you in the following slides. We had journal patterns of care studies in 1999, in 2000 and 2014, we had a pattern of care study on heterotopic ossifications, on heel spur, on desmoids, and on gonathrosis. And looking at the general patterns of care studies in Germany, it gives us a good impression how many patients were treated per year and how this patient collective is divided in different entities in different diseases. And as you see, most of the benign diseases, benign disorders which are treated in Germany are degenerative, painful skeletal disorders. Hyperproletary disorders um, like dupuytrens or desmoids are only a minor part. And very interesting is a comparison between different years, and we see in a follow-up of only five years, we can see that the number of patients treated 
has nearly doubled. And in a very recent patterns of care a study by Jan Kritz in uh, uh, 2040, we saw that about 68 patients treated in German radiation oncology departments had benign disorders, which means it is a very large share of the, all the patients treated with uh, radiation treatment. So it is very important to focus on this patient. And what we also can do, we can use the patterns of care study to get an impression of the clinical evaluation of the clinical outcome. We see, if you look at the heterotopic ossification, we only had about 10% failure. And if you look at gonathrosis or heel spur, which are painful disorders, the pain response is between 70 and 80%. And we can see it in a very, very large number of patients. And looking at the aggressive fibromatosis, the desmoids, which is a very rare entity, we can have outcome parameters from more than 300 patients, which is the largest collective uh, published. And uh, we see the local control of radiation therapy is also very high, a little more than 80%. And how can we use the patterns of care studies in the increase of evidence in benign disorders? If we look at the normal uh, hierarchy from uh, study from studies beginning with phase one feasibility, phase two efficiency, phase three studies randomized superiority, and the phase four which means the quality assurance. And here can the patterns of care study make two things. We can define a standard of care, a standard of treatment. And with this standard of treatment, we can skip the phase two and go directly to a phase three, or we can use it in, in the phase four as a quality assurance for uh, uh, the patient's outcome. And with this phases, the evidence also in benign diseases increases. And if, and if you look at this system theory, theory model of the patterns of care study uh, developed by Dona Bedian, we see the CIS patterns of care study did not only have this three components, structure, process, and outcome. It can have also several other socioeconomic dimensions, which are also important to have in mind. So come to the conclusions. Patterns of care study are an effective method for the continuous quality evaluation radius therapy for benign diseases. Several patterns of care studies have successfully completed and further planned. For example, a patterns of care study on adipotrans disease, and they will help to improve the quality and to finally improve the outcome of the patient. And the closing remarks may also come from Dona Bedian, who says ultimately, the secret of quality is love. And with these words, I like to close and I like to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy about your question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mick. We appreciate that presentation. Um, the first question coming in is, is more around referral patterns. I'm not sure if it would be appropriate for you or another presenter, but. Um, Regarding the, the patient referrals in um, Germany specifically, are the, are the patients usually being referred by hand surgeons or foot surgeons, um, or are they more self-referred or from their primary care providers? It is a good and interesting question. 
and uh, in Germany it's more or less so that most of the patients ca came by themselves or by their primary uh, phys physicians, not by specialized surgeons like hand or foot surgeons, because we have uh, some uh, discussion with this group about groups about the um, effic uh, uh, efficacy of a radiotherapy. Okay, thank you. Um, you spoke a little bit about this during your presentation, but it would be good to add a little bit of color. Um, what is the impact of the pattern of care studies and quality assurance with regard to radiation therapy and benign diseases? What, what do you think is the impact so far and, and what we have to look forward to and future treatment protocols? Uh, what we have seen in the, in all of the presentations, we have still a lack of good, uh, good uh, constructed randomized trials. So the evidence, overall evidence in most benign diseases is a little bit low, even in, in uh, uh, Dipitrans disease and even more in Morbus Lederhose where the numbers of patients are very low. And to overcome this problem, uh, we can try to um, collect data from a lot of patients, in particular in more uh, rare diseases like uh, aggressive fibromatosis or morbus lederhose. Um, and this way may help us to provide some type of evidence, clearly not uh, grade one or two evidence, but maybe uh, evidence of the levels three and four, and that may be even helpful to uh, to give us an impression how how good is the effect of radiotherapy. Okay, thank you. Uh, final question: um, Do you have a multidisciplinary team assessing the patients for benign diseases requiring radiotherapy? Uh, in our hospital, we we have, but that is not the rule. No, um, we have a, a, a team of uh, surgeons, uh, orthopedics, radiotherapy, radiologists. That is what uh, sh uh, what should be. What is uh, what is the best way to do it? But uh, often the radiation oncologist is on its own to. Uh, to, to, to do uh, the, the indication. Okay, thank you so much. Um, to the attendees, if you have any additional questions for Dr. Mick, you can go ahead and submit them in the questions panel. We'll make sure uh, to get those questions over to Dr. Mick. Again, thank you, Dr. Mick, for your thoughtful presentation. Uh, we do have two more presentations to go. As I mentioned, we are anticipating that this session will run a little bit over. So if you do need to peel off we certainly understand we will be providing you with a recording via email next week. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Ray Agawa. Um, Dr. Agawa is based in Japan and has pre-recorded his session for us today. Um, and for that reason, we'll not be taking any questions. So after Dr. Agawa's presentation, we'll move right on to the final speaker of the day. Um, Dr. Agawa will be presenting on radiation therapy for keloid scars, the Japanese Combined Surgery Plus Radiotherapy Experience. Okay, so thank you for joining webinar. This is Ray Wawa from Tokyo, Japan. I'd like to talk about radiotherapy for keloids. So I have organized scar and keloid specialized clinics since 2006. Now new patients of number is 2000 in a year. So this is keloids, sometimes caused by piercing, injury, burn, and surgery. And this is hypertrophic scars. Actually, inflammation of a hypertrophic scar is smaller than keloid. So this is histopathology of hypertrophic scar tissues. Inflammation can be found in the reticular dermis. Also, this is keloid tissue. The also epidermis and the papillary layer of dermis, the inflammation is very limited and mainly inflammation can be found in reticular dermis. So it is suggested that hypertrophic scans keloids are inflammation of 
dermis, reticular dermis. Actually, the difference about hypertrophic scans keloids are difference of strength and duration of inflammation of the dermis. So important things is that there are favorite sites of keloids. And these sites are frequently stretched or subjected to high stretching tension. So this is computer simulation of skin stretch. When we stretch skin horizontally, the high tension area arises on the edge of keloid because stiffness of keloid is hard, so cannot release tension. So adjacent skin, the tension increase. So please compare to the clinical appearance. The inflammatory region is completely matched with high tension area. So high tension, tension is an re important risk factor of keloid. So for clinical meaning, it is important to release tension. So sometimes we use Z plus D to release tension. So immediately after surgery, zigzag line wound is produced. And the three months after surgery, please look at horizontal wound. Inflammation has already gone. And six months after surgery, one year after surgery, tension released and inflammation decreased. So actually, keloid looks like burning house, strong inflammation. And the repeating stretching is look, looks like adding fuel to the fire. So our treatment modalities are there are many modalities from mild treatment to strong treatment, including radiation. So sometimes such kind of strongly burning house should be treated by operation and radiotherapy. And the inflammation once decreased, we should change to the mild modalities. So actually the keloid and hypertrophic scar is an inflammation, not tumor, so steroid works. So our target should be reticular dermis, deep layer of the dermis. And the steroid is injected, inflammation decreases little by little. So the size of keloid is small, we can treat by steroid injection. And especially in Japan, we can use very strong steroid tape. This is very effective treatment. Every day patients have to change the tape. But uh, for children, the for children, the weak steroid tape would be fine because skin sickness is not so thick. In, but uh, adult patients, the strong eclaplaster, the prodon propionate should be a first choice. And such kind of minor keloids can be treated by steroid tape only. I'd like to move to the talk about radiation monotherapy. This is very strong modality to decrease inflammation of keloids. We have used mainly beta ray electron beam, but sometimes we have used brachytherapy, gamma ray. Actually, beta ray is easy to adjust the depth, and uh, after penetrating dermis, the immediately decrease the dose, so uh, it is clearly safe. So beta ray is a primary choice for keloid in Japan, and uh, we have used protector and bolus to adjust sickness. And sometimes for incisional wound, we have used external brachytherapy. This is primary radiotherapy. We have used 25 gray five fraction for five days, but please look at the clinical cases. The after radiation, color was firstly changed. This means number of blood cell, blood vessels decrease and inflammation decrease and the scar height decrease and maturation is accelerated. 18 months after treatment, it became completely mature scar. This is also inflammation completely decreased and that changed to mature scars. This is also peripheral area, the high tension area, inflammation is strong, so treated by radiotherapy, just peripheral area. This is another case. But the sicker keloids cannot be treated by radiation monotherapy because the radiation dose should be increased. So uh, in that case, post-operative radio radiotherapy would be better. So before 2002, we have used 15-gray unified protocol. But uh, 
total recurrence rate is around 30 percent. This is an acceptable result. So we have changed since 2003 and we have optimized the customized dose protocol and the high tension area was treated by increased dose, 20 gray, and the yellow was decreased to 10 gray. And in the result, the total recurrence rate decreased to the 12 percent. And uh, this is the most recent protocol. We have changed and optimized little by little the protocol. And uh, now, anterior chest wall scapula, upper arm, high tension area is treated by 18 gray, three fractions, three days. And the yellow is treated by eight gray, one fraction, one day. And other regions are treated by 15 gray, two fraction, two days. For example, if the surgery is performed Wednesday, the radiation started Thursday. And the for, for example, three fractions, three days in case the radiation is performed Thursday, Friday, and Monday. So actually we have considered biological effective dose in case of keloid, alpha beta seems to be 10. And uh, there is an evidence that the risk of cultural genesis is low when we set BD to less than 30 gray. So BD 30 gray equal 20 gray, four fractions, four days, and the 18 gray, three fractions, three days. So high tension area was treated by 18 gray, three fractions, three days in recent years. And this is questionnaire against radiation oncologist. So uh, actually the attitude of radiation oncologist to three kilo is different by regions. For example, there are a big difference between Europe and North America. So Japan, North America, 90% of radiation oncologists accept keloid treatment using radiotherapy, but just 50% of European oncologists accept the keloid treatment using radiotherapy. Also, we have discussed the risk of side effect, risk and the side effect of radiotherapy for keloids. In the in conclusion, we have concluded we should avoid it in children and infants, and that we should avoid it in thyroid and mammary glands area. So I'd like to share my cases. The simple suture and radiotherapy. They remove everything and tension is removed and radiotherapy was performed. This is chest wall surgery and remove everything and sutured and radiotherapy. And sometimes we have used W plus D and Z plus D to release tension. Tension is released and radiotherapy was performed 18 months after surgery, a two year after surgery, similar case. And uh, this case was also surgical keloid, surgical scar. Keloids are removed everything and Z plus D is performed. And 18 months after surgery. And this is also scapula keloids, 18 months after surgery and radiotherapy. And such kind of sick keloids are a good indication of surgery and postoperative radiotherapy. And this is VCZ vaccination keloid. Tension is released and radiotherapy was performed. This is trauma keloids. Remove everything and Z plus D and radiotherapy. Two years after surgery. Long linear incision should be segmented. And uh, sometimes local flap has been used for huge keloids. This is keloids started from folliculitis, not burn cases, folliculitis keloids. The contractured area is replaced by skin flap and the margin is irradiated. And uh, you can realize range of motion was improved completely. And this is a uh, elbow joint and the chest wall. This is another case. This is the keloids, severe keloids with multiple diabetic ulcers. So now we can, we can conclude keloids and hypertrophic scars can now be cured completely because such kind of severe cases, they remove everything and the flap is raised and release tension and the radiotherapy was performed. So please look at this range of motion improved a lot. And the sometimes core excision method was used for specific region, including cartridge part of oligo, 
the just core is excised because here it is an inflammation of reticular dermis. So just reticular dermis is removed and suture softly and radiotherapy was performed. So we don't need to cut ear, just the core is excised and skin flap is turned, turned back to the backside and sutured and radiotherapy was performed. So there are no recurrence, 18 months after surgery. And the wedge excision can be used for earlobe, such kind of big piercing keyhole, cut and suture and radiosep. This case was treated by post-operative radiation 10 grade to fraction two days. This is another case. So now in Japan, main treatment for scars is a control of tension and inflammation. So primary choice is steroid tape and plaster. If it doesn't work, surgery and radiotherapy is the second choice. So we should know even severe keloids can now be cured completely, mainly using surgery, radiation, and steroid tape plaster. And on a case-by-case -case basis, silicon gel, seeds, tape, steroid injection, lasers, ointment, and uh, next makeup therapy are selected. So we have a lot of cases. So uh, we always welcome visitors from all over the world. So if you are interested in, please stop by Tokyo and the rest discuss about chemo treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Agawa. Again, Dr. Agawa recorded his session previously from, um, from Japan and is not available today for Q&A. With, with that, I'd like to introduce our final presenter for the day. Uh, Dr. Aaron Wolfson. Dr. Wolfson will be speaking on imaging of benign fibromatosis, the prognostic value of MRI for Dupuytren's and Lederhose disease. So I will turn it over now to Dr. Wolfson. Good afternoon. I want to thank the symposium organizers for inviting me to present on our work at the University of Miami regarding the role of MR imaging in the management of this uncommon patient population. I have no, nothing to disclose. Uh, the purpose of our work uh, is to determine the feasibility of quantifying signal changes in superficial fibromatoses using radiomics and T2 mapping. And specifically, when we refer to superficial fibromatoses for this discussion, we're talking about the hands and feet. Uh, when it, the fibromatosis involves the proximal palmar aponeurosis, we're referring to Dupuytren's disease. And similarly, with involvement of the uh, flexor tendons of the feet and the deep plantar aponeurosis, in that location, we're referring to letter hose disease. The, um, our hypothesis was uh, or centered on treat, treated lesions exhibiting a lower T2 relaxation time and uh, displaying different textural features after treatment than prior to treatment. Um, I, again, our uh, background on this um, research uh, centered on treated lesions exhibiting lower T2 relaxation times um, than untreated lesions, in particular regarding the textural features or radiomics. And at the beginning uh, of this uh, presentation and others uh, for the, the last several days, focusing on letter hose disease and Dupuytren's disease, um, we at Miami were looking at the um, division of the um, uh, entity as nodules in the in the palmar or plantar fascia involving decreased P2 signal intensity, and this is in particular of the proliferative stage where the fibroblasts are multiplying, forming benign fibrous nodules and cords, and of course laying beginning to lay down the collagen, it's at this initial proliferative stage where we felt our MR imaging was particularly sensitive 
in identifying the activity that could be um, amenable to definitive radiation therapy. We have published previously in 2018 in skeletal radiology, our initial University of Miami experience that demonstrated the value of T2-weighted MR imaging in the treatment of patients with uh, letter hose as well as du uh, Dupuytren's disease. And in particular, our 10 patients had 37 uh, nodules and all patients were treated using um, Dr. Sagenschmidt's Essen experience of the split course um, electron beam therapy, usually involving six to nine MEV. This delivered 30 gray over 10 daily fractions with a planned 12 week break between fraction five and six. Um, we did the post treatment MRI about three months after fraction number 10. Um, other investigators, Fukawa et al., uh, prior to our uh, publication, had been working with T2 mapping, allowing a quantitative assessment of collagen content in a rabbit model. And their work showed decreasing T2 values also correlated with histologic tendon healing. Thus, our most recent publication in 2021 updated not only our patients getting MR T2 um, evaluation um, of patients getting radiation for Dupuytren's and letter hose, but also we were applying this T2 mapping concept using a single slice region of interest for the dominant nodule in the hand or foot, and then using commercially available software that you see listed there from Germany to uh, run this program. I have to especially acknowledge my colleagues um, uh, who helped in developing this project and the latest publication in particular, uh, Tai Subawang, who really has the um, institutional re uh, research uh, protocol for the T2 mapping of patients with benign superficial fibromatosis. Um, the most recent study involved 19 patients and looked at 27 different lesions, although unfortunately we did not have T2 mapping for all the patients. And I will specify uh, where the T2 mapping was done versus just the evaluation of the um, T2 relaxation times of pre and post irradiated patients. Our MR protocol involved uh, essentially T2-weighted MR, uh, looking at uh, the nodule versus muscle or tendon uh, reference. Sometimes we interchange proton density weighted MR, uh, but basically it was the T2 mapping sequences and it involved the, uh, the elongation times that you see listed there. Our radiomic features of the uh, T2 mapping involved, uh, in particular, Shanton's entropy, kurtosis, skewness, uh, mean of positive pixels and uniformity of distribution of the positive gray level pixels. Uh, just for those who uh, may not be as familiar, uh, the skewness is a measure of the asymmetry of the histogram uh, for these uh, relaxation times and essentially a conversion from a normal distribution to a skewed or asymmetrical distribution. And then entropy, which obviously is borrowed from physics, which is the disorder randomness of the gray level distribution for the pixel orientation within the image in this instance. Uh, from our original uh, 2018 publication, we did show how we graded with uh, Dr. James Banks, who at the time was our uh, fellow in musculoskeletal radiology. And you see, we developed a one through five ordinal scale 
uh, regarding T2 hyperintensity. In that original publication, we also looked at contrast enhance um, and found that that really didn't add. So we have just dropped the contrast and just done plain MRs looking at T2 hyperintensity using the one to five scale with five uh, being equal to uh, vessel activity and uh, one being more equal to the bony cortex, three to muscle. And then you see there two is between the bony cortex and muscle and a grade of four would be between uh, muscle and vessel. Uh, and again, all uh, patients had their uh, post uh, electron beam therapy MRI about three months after um, uh, fraction number 10. So essentially about six months after the pre-treatment MRI. Uh, this just mentions our uh, protocol that we use in particular for the T2 um, uh, MRIs with the slice thickness of around three millimeters and our resolution or matrix in the 300s. Um, <clears throat> the standard uh, protocols that people may be employing uh, for MR uh, were all over the place and we've tried to standardize this for our uh, patient population. Uh, so for the actual T2 mapping of all of our patients, seven subjects had the pre and post MRI T2 weighted and the T2 mapping. And then this just shows some of the techniques that was used and how the map was derived from uh, this pixel-wise mono-exponential non-negative least squares fit analysis uh, using the software from Germany and the acquisition time for the T2 mapping sequence was about uh, almost six uh, minutes, 43 seconds. Uh, just to go back from our original publication in 2018, this shows our uh, typical setup of electron beam for our duper transmissions. I've developed this customized uh, back fix technique with the patient being simulated and treated with arms above the head and you can nicely uh, fixate and reproduce this and maintain the vacuum locking device for the three month uh, hiatus and then restart the patient. You see, I projected the light field um, and we have our lead cutout that you see outlined. This slide just represents the typical setup for my letter hose patients, which is feet first in prone position and you see, just like we would traditionally do, we would uh, wire the uh, fibroma and then a uh, 15 uh, to 20 millimeter normal tissue margin uh, around the patient and then do thin cut CT images. We then will fuse um, with our CT imaging, the MR that we've done pre-treatment on the patient and then also with the uh, radio opaque delineation of the fibroma or, or nodules and the normal tissue margin, come up with a reasonable plan that involved typically six to nine MEV with appropriate bolus that we would place at the time of CT simulation, which was predominantly five millimeters. This just shows one of my patients uh, pre and post uh, treatment to the uh, thenar eminence. Um, and you see the lost pigmentation, sort of a flattened appearance. Um, and in our original 2018 publication, uh, we did show that um, the T2 weighted MR and the contrast enhanced um, MR, as well as symptomatology and reduction of the uh, tumors or the nodule size all correlated, yet we found that uh, MR imaging was the most um, accurate and reproducible. Uh, this is a uh, accident MRI of the hand of one of my Dupuytren's patients, again, over the thenar eminence. 
Um, and on your left, you see the uh, an outline arrows, the pretreatment T2, and on the right, the post-treatment T2, um, and the T2 intensity um, was a more pronounced than the change in size, which was the point I was trying to make. Uh, this sagittal MR of one of my letter hose patients shows pretreatment T2 when an imaging on the left, and then the post-treatment T2 imaging uh, where you see uh, more than the size, although it was some reduction in the thickness of this fibroma in the mid, for, for, mid foot of the patient's foot, uh, but the intensity was significantly reduced. This is our um, um, results of our uh, 2021 patients showing uh, a decreased T2 signal ratio between pre and post treatment, which were for all of the patients, not just the patients we did the T2 mapping. And again, we show the um, increase, if you will, in the T2 skewness for all the study patients uh, looking at T2 skewness and entropy decrease. And this was the two most important findings of our current study. Uh, here is a pretreatment T2 mapping of a Dupuytren study patient. And again, you see in the bottom uh, right side of the slide, the normal distribution, which was basically zero or minus 0 0.1. And then on the follow-up, you now see the increased skewness uh, of 1.4 of that lesion, even though the size may not be significantly affected. Uh, so our T2 mapping, again, shows the decreased T2 intensity gradient on our patients uh, when compared to um, tendon or muscle. And now this shows actually on the right of the slide, the T2 mapping gradient, which is very similar to a heat map if you were doing uh, genomics, for instance. And you see the lesion that's on your left um, is in the green, greenish area. So we are selecting patients um, when we do the pre-treatment um, uh, T2 mapping that have at least moderate to um, heavy um, increase or uptake on the uh, protocol. If they're cold or in the blue, we are tending not to offer radiation therapy. So we're not only using this uh, process for evaluating our patient's response to therapy, but also for selecting patients. Here shows the follow-up um, T2 mapping that we did. And on the left, you see the lesion. Uh, and on the right, you see how it's now cold or blue. And then you see there the T2 decrease from 55 to 41 milliseconds. Uh, this shows a baseline T2 mapping of one of my Dupagen patients. You see the lesion outlined on the right of your slide. And then you see it is. Uh, that greenish, there is a little bit of blue, but we did offer the treatment to the patient. And then you see the follow-up T2 mapping, which permits the quantification of the T2 relaxation time. And you see there that it is heavily blue or cold with the T2 decreasing from 46 to 28 milliseconds. Uh, this slide again shows over our patients, um, all the study patients, um, having decrease in T2 relaxation time. So therefore, our MRI radiomics and T2 mapping, I think we've demonstrated is feasible, uh, and they provide novel biomarkers, uh, both for uh, responsive el electron beam. Uh, you see they're also for using in selection of patients for electron beam therapy. And then you see that the um, lesions responding to um, electron beam therapy. Again, with the radiomics, we see a T2 signal 
decrease from lesion to muscle ratio. Um, the absolute T2 relaxation times can be determined and they decrease. We see that skewness, that radiomics uh, parameter does increase and the radiomics, radiomics parameter entropy decreases. Of course, we, we realize we have limitations. We have a small sample size and we're looking um, mainly at the largest representative region of interest. So smaller no nodules aren't, uh, we aren't able or we aren't trying to uh, map at this point, although we're looking at ways of doing that. Obviously we weren't blinded to whether or not the patient had a pre or post MRI, um, post treatment MRI. And of course we have variable follow-up. Our future directions, further uh, investigations, we think are at least warranted to determine the reliability of this T2 mapping and determination of the skewness um, uh, and the entropy for predicting response to uh, patients with benign fibromatosis of the hands and feet for undergoing electron beam therapy and for ultimately selecting the optimal patient population. Uh, which is benign disease to give ionizing radiation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Wolfson. Um, the first question is, uh, why did you use electro uh, electron beam therapy and not superficial x-rays for Dupuytren's and later host disease? <clears throat> uh, thank you, and I also want to uh, uh, apologize for calling one of my letter Host patients, Dupuytrens. Um, I noticed as I was going through it. So, um, as far as the uh, treatment, um, we only use electrons. We don't have superficial radiation. Okay, thank you. Um, next question: Do you ever radiate patients with nodules having T2 mapping? Studies indicating a low T2 relaxation time. Uh, not anymore. When we've developed it out and I just had a patient recently who we did, uh, she had Dupuytren's disposition, so both hands and feet were involved. The feet, there was medium uh, uptake on the uh, T2 intensity um, and the hands, it was cold, so I'm only treating her feet. Uh, the patient has sought a local um, radiation oncologist to treat her hands. Uh, but I told her I wasn't comfortable with our data in offering treatment if I didn't think I had a reasonable uh, chance of um, of helping her. Okay, thank you. And final question, uh, what do you do if patients have increased nodule size? That's, <clears throat> pardon me, outside your electron beam field after the three-month plan break. So um, this has happened only once or twice when the patient came back and I put them, I always, uh, in, in initiating the second phase of the split course treatment, and I put the light field on with the VAC lock and uh, one or two patients have had the nodule that had grown, if you will, outside of the light field. So what I did was I uh, made a new cutout and obviously um, I gave five fractions to the enlarged uh, volume or uh, region treated, but rather than putting the patient on another three month break um, and giving the final five, the, the area of overlap um, was very minimal. So I used the um, second part of uh, Dr. Sigenschmidt's um, uh, original Essen trial, and I just give uh, seven fractions um, on that split course regimen. So that way I get 21 gray to the encompass the new area. And then of course you give two extra fractions. Um, so it'd be, I guess, 36 gray to the whole area. But at least I feel that's reasonable um, to use. Okay, thank you again so much. <clears throat> With that, on behalf of Extral, I would again like to show our appreciation for Dr. Siegenschmidt, who served as today's session chair. 
Uh, the content was very rich and we owe a lot to Dr. Segan Schmidt for helping us to organize today's session. On behalf of Extra, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I will conclude the session. Thank you so much and have a great day.